Welcome to the show. This is the Magician and the Fool podcast, and we are on episode number 33. My name is Dominic. My co-host's name is Janice, and today is our Halloween episode. So we are speaking with returning guest Nicholas Schreck. We spoke to him Halloween 2019, and so he is back, and we're very pleased that he agreed to come back on. We always like speaking with him and getting his insights on things. He's very blunt to the point, but he's also very compassionate and a very deep thinker. So we feel this is going to be a great episode, and we hope you agree. If you're not familiar with Nicholas, he is an author. He is a musician, a songwriter. If you were alive in the 80s, he was one of the targets of the Satanic Panic so you would have seen him on Geraldo and other other places. He was really out there at that time, and he took a lot of flack. In the episode, we continue our conversation about sonic magic, which we started in the first talk, and we also speak pretty in-depth about the ideas around death and the afterlife, which is appropriate for the season. Before we get into the actual episode, we'd like to say thank you to our very generous patrons. It really is very cool to have your support um, to help us keep this thing going. As always, we dedicate this to Hermes. And may the merits we accumulate doing this work be extended to all sentient beings so that they, together with us, may equally realize awakening.
Okay, welcome to the show, everyone. We are extremely happy to have one of our favorite guests back on the show, Mr. Nicholas Schreck. Um, we're going to talk. We're going to start with talking about Sonic Magic as a continuation of last, um, our last encounter, and then as this is a Halloween episode, uh, we are going to be speaking about death, which is a topic which really is for all seasons and uh, not just Halloween. Uh, something we should always be thinking about. Welcome back to the show, Nicholas. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to be back. Thank you for inviting me. And happy Halloween to your listeners. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for agreeing to come back on. We're elated to have you here, and we're ready to jump into some interesting waters with you. It's, it's hard to believe that it, it's hard to believe that it's already been a year because of everything that has changed on our unfortunate planet in that year so that it seems like a century ago that we spoke although a lot of what we said was relevant to what's happening now particularly the kali yuga and the general deterioration of the mortal realm but it it has been quite a year since the last time we spoke so interesting to reflect on that Oh, for sure for sure and uh, we had i think uh last time we spoke we our, our aim was to uh, recapitulate and extend our conversation about uh, the magic of sound, sonic magic. And uh, so this will be the initial part of this interview will be sonic magic part two. And we're hoping to uh, kind of go a little bit into some of the deeper aspects, the prag- pragmatic aspects of, of how to use sound in magical workings and the influence and even you know the influence and even uh, utility of, of sound in transformation of not only consciousness but even actual material events. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, sure. Fire away then. So I wanted to I wanted to lead in with a discussion about the sort of sound beyond sound that you originally heard in the pyramid in the, in the chamber this is something that well, it well, almost no, it, it wasn't it was it wasn't in the chamber just to correct uh we spoke about this in the last um episode a year ago but kind of like in old radio serials where they they tell you what happened in the last one i guess we should mention that it wasn't okay. in the cha- although i went into the chamber of the pyramid um Earlier in my trip to Egypt, to recap, I took a spiritual pilgrimage in 1983 
to Egypt and to make a long story short, and I've told it before, but just to, to recap where we, we left off in the last episode over a year ago or approximately a year ago, um, in the tomb of Seti the first, the Seti and Pharaoh at the bottom of that tomb, I heard what I described as the sound beyond sound, as the Ur sound or the cosmic sound, what 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 the ancients would have referred to as the music of the spheres, or what you know, various spiritual traditions, the Pythagorean mystery religion, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sufism, all speak of this of the what is the sound that is the foundation from which all other sound vibrates from? And there are many different spiritual approaches based on different cultural and theological and cosmological interpretations of it. But when you have the actual experience, it's beyond any religion, beyond any category. And so that is what happened in the, in the, at the bottom of the tomb of Seti the first. And if you listen to the previous episode on the show um, in which I discuss that, I discuss it in detail. So I don't think I need to re- reiterate that, but just so your listeners know. And that was a major, that was a major initiatory turning point in my life and in my work. I had already been a musician and I already theoretically understood some of these things, but to actually have the very visceral experience of hearing let's just, you know, for convenience sake, call it the sound beyond sound. Um, And seeing that all music comes from it, and that therefore, I immediately had an understanding that music and sound was at least for me, the most important vehicle for the transformation of consciousness, as it had already been for me. But it was at that moment that I saw it as a mission for better or for worse, to that I was responsible for raising the consciousness of I felt it could be, because as we were discussing a little bit before the show, even even in 1983, when I was very young, and even what the social conditions were then, which compared to where we are now, were, you know, that was like paradise compared to where we are now, although there were many grim and and dystopian aspects of that period. Um, that is when I was give, felt that I was given a mission to return to America, which at that point I had left because of the election of Ronald Reagan and the increasing influence of the phony Christian evangelical movement, which was turning into what later became the Satanic Panic, or was starting to, but. I wanted to get away from that, and I went to Egypt, which is kind of youthful stupidity, going from a, you know, a weak beginning of a Christian or pseudo-Christian theocracy in America, right into the heart of what was already, you know, an Islamic dictatorship um, with, with Mubarak, although he was not a fundamentalist. It was kind of naive. I went from Reagan's America to a literal dictatorship of Mubarak. But that contradiction aside, dealing directly with the energy of the Egyptian temples and the ancient Egyptian gods and the Egyptian tombs and all of the energy of it woke something up in me. And it it basically, the way that I've interpreted it is it was a direct communication from the god Set who basically told me, you are being a coward You cannot escape from the ugliness uh, that was going on in America. You have to go back and fight it. And it was a a spiritual battle, not a political or ideological battle, which is hard for people to grasp these days when they can only see things through the very limited perspective of ideology and partisan politics. That it was not a political crusade. It was a spiritual crusade that this fake pseudo-evangelical Christianity, which still has a hold on certain aspects of American society, was something that had to be fought and that it was going to become toxic and virulent, which it did during the whole satanic 
panic period, which I got caught up in very much or became a target of rather. So that was the background to it. So this Ur sound that I heard in the tomb of Seti the First is what I work with in general when I'm doing music and with my voice as a singer and as a musician. It's it became the center of what I work with. And I understood at that point that music and sound was the, was the vehicle, the medium for my message that even though i'm a writer as well that personality and that to really awaken initiation in the mind of other people which was you know absolutely my purpose sound had to be the way to do it so that is a that's a brief description of what happened and a concise explanation of, of what i experienced there and hey, nicholas do you believe that because you had that background in music and you are already really um, involved in that world, that the communication that came to you at that time through sound um, was because you were, you were open to that. Do you, th- do you believe that maybe that's, that's why that was the means of communication? No, that's a good question. It's one of these chicken and the egg things. Was it, was it that the gods spoke to me about something that I was already familiar with, or was I already obsessed with sound and music as I was because that message was waiting for me? Right. Because this is another subtle, subtle thing about when you, when you become a magician, when you enter the magical realm, when you, when you take up the art of sorcery, you are not only dealing with the past and the present, but you're, you are getting messages from your own future. This is something that I've seen. It's something that quantum physics has proven on the physical level is a lot of what's happening with magic. And when I say magic, I don't just mean the crudest, uh, you know, asking the gods to give you something. But, you know, re- really initiatory magic that is transformative and and awakens your consciousness to the highest levels of being and reality, which is ultimately what the art of magic should be. It shouldn't just be, you know, the, as we discussed last time, this kind of selfish manifesting. When you when you are on that level, what you realize is, and this may help beginning magicians as well to understand the process. I've explained this to some of my students recently, and it has actually helped their magical practice. You, When you're doing a ritual, I believe you are not, when, when it is successful, you're not so much making something happen now in the present, but you're also very much picking up something that has already happened in the future, and you're solidifying it, if that makes sense to you. So, I believe the the obsession with music that I had, and I, I was saying to a colleague today that being a musician, there is something almost like a mental illness about it. It's it's almost like the symptoms of schizophrenia. You 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 hear sound, you hear this abstract phenomenon called sound. You hear melodies. You know things come to you full blown. And I have to like stop what I'm doing to write it down or record it immediately. You're capturing something from another world. At least that is my experience of what music is. And, you know, there's an element of craziness to that, of, of going through great lengths and efforts to capture the serial, non-existent, non-physical sensory input sound and then to go out of your way to try to record it, to capture it, to capture this ethereal um, communication in a physical form to share it with others. That is art, but but you see what I mean? There's also fixing the volatile. Yeah, there's some there is something of madness in that too. I mean, how it's it's not very different than hearing voice, except that it's socially acceptable to then make a song of what you're picking up from another world. So I very much see myself as a vehicle between the worlds. And 
I don't know why I was given this particular task. We all are given some task, but the the sensitivity to music and not only to music, but to sound was there from as soon as I came into this planet most recently, it was already there. So it's a, I, it's not a question I can give you a definitive answer, but it is interesting. But I do think you have to take into account the future informs our present and the past. It isn't the way it looks like. It isn't like that the the past is moving towards the present and then towards the future. It's it these what is called in Buddhism the three worlds are communicating with each other all the time. And if you understand that on a subtle level, you'll understand why magic works. It's it's very important to grasp that so you don't waste your time with a false idea of reality when you're especially if someone is beginning to learn the practice of of magic. I think that's really well said. So um, Dominic's question definitely kind of um, dovetails with mine because to me, hearing that sound, I couldn't help but feel as though it sounds like a, a form of what in Western mystery tradition is called the knowledge and conversation of your holy guardian angel. Because typically when people actually have that experience, as opposed to pretending they do, you do get this kind of life mission give to, given to you. you get, you're given this blueprint or or a direction, which at the same time, in some mysterious way, contains something about your true nature in it, something about your your essential mm-hmm. nature. And I can't help but feel as though that's what happened to you here, is in this sort of mystic quest, you're... you're you know, you're hot. You're the. It was a god that spoke to you, but that's also not unusual because um, I think when we hear, like in the um, records of Plotinus, when he was said to have met his daimon, it, it was said to be a god. You know, so some human beings have a, a deity for, you know, you could say their their holy guardian angel as opposed to you know a being that's maybe in a different place in the hierarchies, mm-hmm. and the sound being an especially subtle form of matter in the material world you know it's it's always fascinated and intrigued me because you cannot see sound well you can see sound but that's going in a direction i want to go in later but just on a general everyday basis right. you cannot see sound but yet, yet you can more more than just hear it you can feel it you can physically feel sound that is uh, loud enough or at a certain vibratory rate. And in that regard, I wanted to ask you about the distinctions of different waves or vibrations, notes, uh, octaves of sound, and the way that they can be used to potentially affect the consciousness of the person listening, or even just in general, set the sort of atmosphere of the reality in any given space, whether that's a ritual space, a performative space, a ritual and performative space, or even um, even a wider range, like a, the way that a subsonic vibration can actually extend across mm-hmm. miles and miles. Yeah, well, there's a couple of aspects to that. One is, I mean, my songs are very much consciously a ritual space. They are opening a particular world and within and i actually i think i tend to look at all my artistic activities that way a book is a choice for me they are consciously a a magical locus to gather information and to change consciousness nothing nothing i do whether it's my the film music or or literary work is what it appears to be only it is all ritual activity and i didn't always talk about that before but lately i have thought it is sort of necessary to explain some of these things because there's been there's so much more misinformation and false information since the advent of the internet i think it requires some more elucidation so if i write a song that song is happening in a real place and whatever the song may be about it is evoked it it, so it is you know every every piece of music i've done has been a ritual and in a certain sense it is 
when you record a song, it's always happening. As with a ritual, it's eternal. A ritual never ends. It's 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 if you do it properly, you are outside of time, and that's why the ritual works. So every song I've done, I'm in a certain state of consciousness, and if you want to enter that ritual space through that particular song, it's always accessible to do so. It it remains like a gateway for people to go through. And it is meant, it is an, an initiatory voyage. You know, it could be a three-minute song, it could be a 10-minute song, but they are definitely consciously and unconsciously designed as a, son, a sonic temple, so to speak. A place to, even though, as you say, music doesn't even exist in the physical world, and yet it's very easy to feel that you are going there. I mean, anyone who has a profound effect with music feels like they are there with it. So you could think of my songs as like each of them is a room, a, a room made of this mysterious quality of sound that you can enter and it's meant to transform you. And I, now I don't always know why it does. I very often, as I said, I'm more of a medium than I, I don't set out with a message I receive a message and I transmit the message. Sometimes I'm more conscious of why that's happening than others, but not always. And most of my lyrics, most of melodies, most of the, the, the various ingredients of the song, I very much feel come from somewhere and I'm bringing them to earth. Now, as far as the composition of a song, Every composer, I mean, for instance, let's take film soundtrack composers, know that you're drawing on the legacy of how certain audiences, what, what does a particular sound evoke? So in a sense, you, you are drawing on previous emotional experiences that the listener has had. So we know what funereal music would sound like. You know what, what celebratory music would sound like because you've been given these cues before. So as if in the same way that to understand a language, if you use certain words in a certain succession, it will evoke something in that language, the listener. So with music, you are very often taking, I mean, why is a minor note related to sadness and melancholy or somberness at least? But if you play in the minor scale, you are going to create a melancholy, darker feeling than if you play major, you know, that sort of thing. Why is that? You know, it's absolutely true. And it's even true in other cultures. It's not only in Western music. So why does major imply more bright and joyful and minor create a funereal or melancholy mood? So obviously the, the you know, the, secular musician is working with these kind of stereotypes and cliches that if you play that kind of note if you play this succession of notes or chords it's going to create it is definitely going to create a particular emotional reaction in the listener so if you're a magician and you take these tr these legacies that all musicians inherit from the past that the, you know you know this succession of chords or notes is going to create the sibling. And if you do that consciously and in a in an altered state of consciousness or a higher state of consciousness, whichever way you want to look at it, um, that remains a permanent way to change the consciousness of people who are listening to it. But sometimes it's completely spontaneous. I mean, very often you can achieve an improvisation exactly what you were aiming to get without trying to think of it and and actually this was something that manson taught me about music very early on when we first began speaking was he once said you know don't try only peasants try and i knew exactly what he meant don't force it let the music and he he very much understood music too as if uh mysterious force from another world that comes into you and you become you become the instrument and express it and that was something he stressed that had a big effect on me is just let it 
let it flow through you, let it express itself. And it is very much like invoking or evoking the gods or other spiritual beings. You don't want to block them with your ego, with your personal bullshit. You have to be open to let them fully express themselves. So so it's a it's a fine line between composition and and just allowing the music to speak through you. But both of them are necessary. You need a certain amount of discipline and craft to master the power that's coming through you because otherwise it could just be completely chaotic and would have no effect. You do need it does need to be within certain formal boundaries to be effective. So if does that begin to answer your question, hopefully. Definitely. And I, it, it really um, it kind of leads me into a series of other thoughts. Um, one thing that what you were just talking about also makes me think of is, for instance, as, a, as an example, the devil's fifth or the devil's right. interval. Right. I looked at that a lot in the early 80s and looked at the whole history of it in ancient times and why it was that way. I mean, I really did. As much as I, I, I work instinctively as a musician, I really did a lot of groundwork to figure out what it, why do these things happen. So that's, yeah, that's a perfect example in Western culture. Of course, it doesn't mean anything in cultures where the devil is not relevant. But in, in our Western Christianized culture, it definitely has been very important. Well, and there's also the evocation of the, the emotional tones of um, the music, too. I was reading about a genetic phenomenon called uh, transvection, because, uh, like me, I have the experience of having music appear in my mind or ear spontaneously, and sometimes I think that can happen with ideas too. And so I was learning about transvection, which is it's a phenomenon. I'm going somewhere with this. It's an epigenetic phenomenon, and basically, an allele on one chromosome and an allele on another chromosome uh, kind of communicate, and that leads to gene activation or gene repression. And what's interesting to me is the context that I understood it intuitively when it, the idea popped into my mind was one of magical transvection or even uh, sonic transvection, where you're the magician, so you're essentially the transformer. You're the conductor of this force and this energy and when you conduct it you're potentially for those who are able to who have ears to hear i guess you could say there's a potential for them to be act what is something within their soul or consciousness to be activated by what you're communicating and i think with you that's intentional right well whether it's intentional or not it's just the way it is i am personally just i've always been very conscious i am a doorway to something. And to a certain extent, I'm not so much a formal magician as a medium. I am a magician and I do set out and have particular intentions, but more and more, I really think I'm just a vessel, a doorway to allow people here to experience what is happening on the spiritual planes. Um, and, I, and I have to say too, part of it is, like I was saying before, that there's, there's almost something a little bit crazy about being a musician, about having this obsession of translating these ethereal sounds into coherent messages, which you could, would you, you feel a burning desire to bring that to other people, a melody. But that's in something intrinsically crazy about it. But it's also, it's more shamanic, it's more healing than only magical. I mean, maybe that's an important point too is it's a fine line between magic and mysticism where you where you are you i feel like i receive these things and very often they are prophetic and i'm not saying that that that's not because of my great genius that i foresee things i pick up messages and the messages are very often accurate but they're not something i formulated and part of the reason for that is a personal thing of one's own karma is and with this is something we have discussed privately i is that um i'm not from here you know i'm this this world this realm i'm very clear about this and i always have been i'm visiting your realm i mean you, i know you don't even feel like it's your realm but i'm speaking generally so 
for whatever purpose, for whatever reason, and I'm not fully cognizant of why, most of what my activity seems to be is to to be exactly as you're speaking about this transforming agent. I'm the gateway that can earth that can earth these spiritual impulses from other worlds and bring them into a form to to understand. And I understand people don't have that ability. That may be the only way they can encounter spiritual reality, which shockingly to me, more and more, I realize most people have no idea what we're talking about when we speak of the spiritual world. They don't understand it or see it as a real phenomenon that is constantly occurring and that is part that is affecting this material world. So I that's that's you have sort of have to understand how I view myself, which for all effects and purpose, I could seem like a somewhat functioning human being, but that is just a that's just like a temporary vehicle for something going on. And I've become more and more conscious of that, of just being an agent of something else. It's not it's not really me. I love that idea of the musician uh, as being a medium, and that's literally what you are. You are the medium, median principle between kind of the disembodied and the material, as uh, Janice was saying, is sound being kind of a very subtle level of the material. So you are kind of doing a, a demiurgic work. You're, you're almost like a spirit of the crossroads in that way, as you're a membrane between those those two realms, making it available to those in this in this world right. skillfully executing that in conjunction with other media is probably the most effective way to do ritual for instance you know as you were speaking about different tones and sounds uh, evoke different emotions which is a fact um, in the same way different smells do that i mean burning sulfur and burning frankincense creates different emotion and visually, um, there are visual things you can do. Right. So combining all of those things sounds like uh, the way to go for sure. Um, and can you coordinate that? Can you? Well, it, 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 yeah, yeah. It was always clear. I mean, because what am I? I? I use every art form. I mean, most of my activity has been musical, but film, even acting, more and more, uh, theater, books. Um, Every everything, and then it's interesting you mentioned the olfactory of scent, because tying into that, uh, my manager Annie Barta, who has a company called Siphon Hexa Berlin, um, for for Halloween, since this is the Halloween episode, she she could you know Siphon Hexa means soap witch, but kind of tying into the magical work that I do with music, she has created a perfume or a scent that is supposed to evoke a particular song oh, wow and that is buried alive by radio a werewolf and she's putting it out on halloween and it ties into exactly what you're saying it's the it's the medium from the spiritual world that matters it doesn't matter whether it it comes into this world as sound or as a scent so she is very specifically doing magic with scent, which is just as powerful as music, in fact, but you know, both of them complement each other. So I just wanted to point out it's interesting you mentioned that because on this Halloween, she's actually releasing this scent on her site. I believe you can get it through her Etsy account on Siphon Hexa Berlin is and, and that's a buried alive perfume tied into the music. And so you know, you could express it in different ways. Somebody else could make a painting of the same forces that came into being with that particular song. So you're right, you know, and, and very much I am influenced by Richard Wagner's concept of the Gesamt Kunstwerk, which always the total artwork, which made sense to me that what, what matters to me is not the medium, but what is communicated to the audience. And I very much don't do art for art's sake. I what I mean what I'm doing it only has meaning in terms of it being communicated to others. Another thing you pointed out that's true as far as I'm concerned why do a ritual in your living room that will reach you and whatever spirits are hearing it why not do it and make it an eternal thing that has a positive effect being 
of benefit. I mean, assuming you're doing rituals of benefit. So therefore, when you make a song, film, a novel, a book, a dance piece, um, for instance, I'm increasingly working in writing music for dance. And that, that, you know, I've done that last year. And until the COVID thing, there would have been another performance involving music and dance that I was doing. So definitely I try to incorporate all the arts into everything I do, but it, it's all a ritual. And, and a magician can understand that. They see that instinctively. Someone else will see, okay, it's just a song and they'll never see it, anything else, but it's just a song. But everything I've done is a ritual. And a lot of the ritual is reaching out to the spiritual world and bringing it into this world, which I almost have a feeling of, and I think this is conveyed in a lot of my music, a feeling of homesickness for the spiritual world from which I came into this material world in a Gnostic sense, which I think anyone familiar with Gnosticism would understand that. Thank you for that. That was very well said. All, you know, all of the arts began as magic, every single one. The first songs were prayers. The first artwork that we know was ancient, you know, prehistoric people trying to to use hunting magic. The first things that were drawn were partially religious, but they were also magical. They had a, the, the, the art was made to create, to make something happen. The first songs that we know of are prayers. They weren't secular. So the arts in general are directly connected to mankind's spiritual activity, and they have become debased over the years into merely entertainment. Not that there's anything at all wrong with entertainment, but if you go back to the roots of all the arts, I mean, dance was a spiritual activity and still remains so in some cultures. Theater at least in the Western tradition, going back to ancient Greece, the catharsis ritual, which theater was supposed to create. I mean, people talk about that in a secular way now, but going to the theater in ancient times was participating in a ritual. So what I'm doing is nothing, it's not avant-garde or novel or new. It's actually quite ancient. And I think um, most of what I'm doing is actually deeply traditional, not modernist. And would be understood by ancient peoples, but not obviously not understood by modern rationalists very well. No, in fact, I think that you're definitely a traditionalist in that regard, and you're maintaining, you're carrying forth a tradition. And it's you know the tradition of this, the union, the unio mystico, one could say of of magic and art. Which I, you read my mind. I was about to go into that that fact i think i think i really at this point in my life i consider it a fact that magic and art are really two sides of the same coin it's not that we infuse art with magic it's that magic is inherent art is inherently magical and so when we craft it consciously we're actually putting it to its true use and i think that the relationship to the muses and the relationship that uh, even plato talks about with art is is definitely uh, aligned with that i and i know that i would consider you a symbolist i'm i'm a huge absolutely it's my favorite you know school of artists it's all i've been to multiple exhibitions of symbolist art and i think you fall squarely in the symbolist uh school absolutely. of art. absolutely i mean it, as you might have seen in a timely fashion just the other day the day before yesterday i attended the this huge ex, exhibition here in Berlin at the at our national gallery, which is called in uh, to translate it from German decadence and um, let's see what was it called exactly decadence and dark dreams decadence und dunkel trauma and it's all about Belgian symbolism and actually for the first time I was able to see many of my the, the most influential symbolist paintings and sculptures and artwork all in one place and that was like a religious experience for me so that's very astute i mean i would if i was in the 19th century everything i'm doing and saying would be totally common so i i absolutely agree that i i, I in some ways as i think i may have mentioned in our last 
or one of our conversations, partly I'm a beatnik, I would say, if I had to define a subcultural category, but definitely above all a symbolist in the in the in the tradition of the 19th century and early 20th century symbolism. If people look into that whole genre and field, they will see what I'm doing, the using art as magic and magic as art. With, you know, that was an idea of the symbolist movement. And it isn't that I was only influenced by it, even before I knew what it was. That's what I understood one was doing. I mean, even the earliest when I was a child, or the earliest theatrical presentations I did, and I always was doing or draw a drawing. I always knew it was to have a purpose, not just to be entertaining or aesthetic, but to make something happen. Yeah, I can relate to that personally too. When I found the Symbolist School of Artists, I was relieved and excited, you know, earlier in my life to find this because. I was like, yes, they get it. This is what art's supposed to be about. This is this is it. And when you see a you know a Jean Deville painting, you know, or or Ferdinand Knopf painting, uh, or you hear Eric Satie's mm-hmm. Gymnopodies, um, there, right? You get that. All, same- all of those. I mean, those are all. Those are three of my favorite artists. Absolutely, Knopf, Delville. I mean, I've used Delville's art on my book, Flowers from Hell, and as an illustration in some of the book that Zena and I co-wrote, Demons of the Flesh, one of my all-time favorite artists, as is Fernand Knopf. Um, and Satie's music was greatly influential to me. So, yeah, we're definitely on the same page of dreamers of decadence there, completely. (laughs) Yeah, and I, I mean, even even when you're getting into the darker stuff, like um, like uh, oh boy, I was I was just about to say his name and it escaped my mind, but he, you know, he did the more erotic symbolist art, or or reading some of the Felician symbolist Europe. novels, Felician Europe's, yes, exactly. Um, it just that's what speaks to me, yeah. and it it speaks to me also because of the purpose. And in our modern age, we. Or I think, and the existentialists attempted to address this, but fell short through the sort of materialistic nihilism. But we're we're suffering from a void of meaning. In fact, there's a hypersaturation of information everywhere. But it's like the signal to noise ratio is at least equal because with every bit of information, there's misinformation. And so, I think that people are suffering right. from a, a deprivation of meaning. People are suffering from a meaning famine and absolutely i I couldn't agree more actually going going to the symbolist exhibit here in berlin the other day i very much thought that is that in the 19th century and in the early part before world war one that people would look at these things and understand what these you know these mythical references were part of a normal education at that time people would know who minerva was and what she signified people would know who the nymphs were what the muses were who medusa was and i it occurred it struck me how almost like humanity has had a stroke and has amnesia of its entire tradition of everything i mean the modern person today and not only the maligned millennial generation but but the entire world has been afflicted with this amnesia ancient references that people would have understood in symbolist art how many you know only people who've gone out of their way to study them would even get these mythological references they would they would literally be meaningless to most people they would they would be able to see the colors and the shapes but have no idea of the whole ancient language of mythology and tradition that informs them and and the thing is mythology so i agree is, the lack and and this is well, go ahead i'm sorry go no, ahead I, I apologize for intruding on your thought i didn't mean to interrupt you no it's okay C- continue the thought it's fine we don't have to be so polite go ahead <laughs> <laughs> um the uh the, i was just gonna say and i think you know this i know this dom knows this but and many of our listeners, I think, understand this. But for those who don't, you know, mythology is not just—it's not just stories. It is 
it is actually spiritual it is re- we could e- you could even say mythology is religious it ha- it it is absolutely oh absolutely it well what is called mythology is what the reigning religions call the ancient religions that they deliberately supplanted i mean to a, to an, on another extent the bible is mythology that doesn't mean it's not true either that's not what i'm saying not in a juvenile atheist way those the myths of jesus the myths of the various biblical figures are no different and in fact they come from the same tradition as the greco-roman egyptian babylonian mythic pantheon all of which they 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 are very much drawn from and in many ways different versions of so mythology is not absolutely not just narratives or stories or as is often um contemptuously said because the fairy tales of europe that were collected by the brothers grimm or perot and all the others that was the religion of europe those, those stories you know even though they're very degraded from where they started that that is our european religion just as the stories in the New Testament or Old Testament are part of an ancient Middle Eastern mythology that goes way beyond that particular book. Um, And the other thing I think people don't understand about mythologies, and I want to return to your question about this hollowness and lack of meaning in the modern world, this, this that you referred to Um, mythology. If you take a story of the gods from any of the various pantheons, the Greek, the Egyptian, the Mayan, the Aztec, the Northern, the Babylonian, Native American, you know, what have you, Inca, doesn't matter. The mythology is not a story. It is it is an instruction in the way the universe is. It, it is an initiatory lesson that's telling you how the universe actually functions but it can only be understood and read by someone who is on that frequency to see it that way. So the battle between Horus and Set is not uh, an adventure story about a battle between Horus and Set only. It's something much deeper. It's telling you this is how reality works. And it's in a way that cannot, you you couldn't write a paragraph, a rational paragraph that would explain the way reality works as powerfully as these myths do and in that way they are like music in that they that you have to you have to surrender to the logic of the mythology to get the lesson now most people just think these are human invented stories that have a more i mean particularly left-wing people interpret all religion and all mythology as some sort of corrupt power mechanism that humans design to trick people and I think it's very important to stress that's not the case. They are they are organic messages from other worlds that humans can grasp that teaches them the nature of reality. And, you know, understanding a myth can transform you. Truly understanding, you know, what is Pandora's box? What does that mean on a on a spiritual level? If you could truly understand it, you would awaken to a higher level of consciousness. That these, these are leftover fragments of the mystery religions that humanity has forgotten the meaning of. Beautifully put. Whether, um, I, oh, sorry, Janice. I was just going to say, I, I really liked your how you phrased that, Janice, the, uh, what is it, um, famine of meaning, I think you said. Um, I, I think, yes. unfortunately, part of the issue is that humanity's ability to take meaning from symbols has been hijacked to a degree and almost monopolized by the media and corporations in that they uh, symbols don't, you know, everyone knows what a, the golden arches mean, you know, they see the golden arches and they start to get hungry. Right. But, but yeah, they don't know what right. the symbolism of a Griffin would stand for. So um, we're definitely, no, no, absolutely, absolutely. Right. Well, we're, we're lacking in any kind of education. I mean, people of, you know, in the 1930s, you still got a classical education. It would be considered part of being a, you know, culturally aware to know what a griffin is. Now, people wouldn't even be able to recognize one, even though they're incorporated in architecture all over the world from a certain period. 
I mean, but that's the reality I live in. I live in the reality of the myth. I don't live in the reality of McDonald's. I'm not part of that at all. And I, I think both of you are the same way to, to a certain degree. I was saying to someone just today that the way that most people have to force themselves out of the material world to think about the spiritual world, to do magic, is the complete opposite for me. I have to really force myself to pay attention to the material phenomenal world and not be purely in the spiritual world. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. In, in a way, it's actually um, very inconvenient. But, you know, that ties into this whole thing of being a gateway between the worlds. So I take I take the mythology, I take the mythology and the symbolism much more seriously than this supposed real world. And, and that would be too big a subject to get into one into one podcast. But what is the nature of reality? Mythology is much more real than the world that your senses are touching this temporary illusion that you're investing so much time and energy in is a passing dream. The mythology is eternal. And uh, what I was going to say a moment ago was that whether people like it or not, mythology informs our lives and creates patterns that we live within. You know, it's, it's inevitable. Either you come to understand mythology and embrace it, or you don't, and it still will influence and affect your life. Your life will be, it's, it's, you know, there's so many historical examples of this. I mean, perhaps one pertinent to the current age is, you know, you see these evangelical Christians who become hateful and jealous, like the God they worship um, or the God image they worship. On the other hand, you know, you could talk about how the, head of the fraternitas saturni died of uh, i think it was like testicular cancer or prostate cancer and it's interesting how that works i knew somebody who was who was a capricorn and was also uh, considered herself a uh, setian and her feet would she had problems with her feet splitting open which is like hooves right well people don't pe- that's how magic works. It very literally works that way. And and a lot of people would just say, "Oh, that you're just being superstitious. That you know, that's your, it's just a coincidence." <laughs> and those people are hopeless. The the symbolism is is being shown to us by the actual physical world all the time. It's a language that is speaking to us. The advertising that happens to be in front of you at that moment is part of the universal mind speaking to you and telling you something. If you were to take the words that people say to you and you had some distance from it, whatever is being is symbolism that is communicating something very deep about the universe, even though it may seem completely trivial and banal, is that, and then this gets into a deeper issue as far as magic and art. This universe, this, this phenomenal world that we live in, is also a work of art. And it has a meaning in the same way that you watch a film and you can take the plot of a movie and just look at it as a, as a banal narrative, or you can see it as a metaphoric symbol of something about human nature, which is true of many classic films. I mean, you could just, you could think of any off the top of your head. They convey something mythical, but this experience we're having in this mortal realm is like a work of art. And if you are detached enough to not get caught up in it, you can start to learn that what we're experiencing at this moment, whether it's wonderful, terrible, or neutral, is a mythic symbolic communication from the universal mind that is telling us something. And now most people have no idea that that's happening, and it would be very difficult to convey it to them. But, you know, what we're doing right now is part of a a lot the large work of art of the universe and that's like i i have often advised my students to understand this to take a day in their life like you wake up in the morning look at everything you experience that day as if you were in an art museum and you're not you don't get involved with it you just look at it you study it you see it like the way you look at a painting to think did the painter mean by this 
if you could look at your life that way, you would start to see a pattern and that there is an ordering principle. And this gets into the design of the universe, that it is manufactured, it is made, it is invented, and there are certain light motifs and themes that keep recurring that we see in dreams, that we see in myths. I mean, Jung understood this, and, and uh, Jungian psychology of all the various psychological methods comes the closest to being a helpful model of reality. But this very thing that we're in is a designed work of art that communicates something. I can't help but think of the importance in the Egyptian pantheon of Thoth and the conveyance of, of language through hieroglyphics um, seems very much along the same lines of what you're talking about. Absolutely. Well, the, well, the Egyptians, the Egyptians understood that. I mean, the in the beginning was the word in the Bible. For the Egyptians, the word for a magician, as you probably know, was one who speaks. Mm -hmm. So the ability to speak and to take from it's kind of like I said, taking the, the ethereal sound and turning it into a song. Right. A magician is taking the raw filtered chaos of the thought process and by ordering it, recreating reality. So one who speaks is what is what an Egyptian magician was called. That shows you the importance of not only words, but of sound to express vocally and verbally you can change reality. You can change your own consciousness by the simple manipulation of a sentence. So, yeah, that's a, and Toth is the son of Set. He he is actually the son of the unnatural union of Horus and Set during their contending. And there's a lesson in that, for instance, in terms of mythology being a symbolism. What does it mean that Horus and Set have this battle? And they have this sexual union, which would have been considered extremely taboo and unnatural in according to Egyptian morality. But out of this perverse act of rape, wisdom, Toth, is born. And there's a very important lesson in that. And, and this is true with all the relations between the gods. Why does Venus have this passionate affair with Mars while she is married to Hephaestus? The is, this tells you something about reality. It's not just a dusty old story in, a, in an antique book. Well, and I want to jump in here real quickly on that note and mention, you know, you were talking about how um, even the Bible is related to the same sort of um, mythic structure as, say, the Greco-Roman Egyptian myths. And the seven is such an important the number seven is such an important part of that representing the seven cosmic planetary gods but those same mm -hmm. cosmic forces those gods are also manifest in the seven inter the seven musical notes and the seven colors of the rainbow right which relates right back to what you're talking about well, the, now here, let me illustrate how what we're doing is a, is a work of art that the universe is creating. There's a synchronicity there in that one of the last things that I wrote for the new version of the Manson file is is um, a chapter about how I got into the whole phenomenon, which people are always asking me, and I didn't really get into the personal part of it in the last editions, but since this is the final one, I did. And it begins with a description of all, everything you said, how Pythagoras saw in the seven notes gateways to spiritual understanding and consciousness, the seven planets, um, the seven gateways that Ishtar descends into the underworld for her initiation, uh, the seven statements that Jesus makes on the cross, the seven seals in Revelation, the seven letters of the name Abraxas, and on and on. And we can think of many, many others. But the reason I mentioned, I just think it's interesting that you brought that up, because I'm, I was comparing it to, in terms of the file, where people ask me, how did I get into this, that, that Alice in Wonderland falls down the rabbit hole when she's seven years old, and I was seven years old. This film, Dance of the Vampires, by Roman Polanski, they gave me this 
uncanny premonition of something dreadful, and that was a few days before the murders, and and that the people involved in that film eventually were the people many years later in the 90s revealed to me what happened. So in terms of turning points and initiation, the number seven is crucial. And almost every culture has recognized that, that it's, it's a, it's a turning point. It's, it's what initiation really means, a turning point in understanding and a raised consciousness. So it's interesting you brought that up out of the blue, because I had just been thinking about that. Now, I want to uh, kind of segue into discussing something that is pertinent to the present time, not only the, the, the month we're in and the season we're entering into with the advent of uh, Scorpio, but also, uh, generally speaking, even this year, and that is the topic of death. Right. Well, also, literally, metaphysically, tonight, Halloween, which is when your listeners will hear this, although we're saying it slightly before, is the time where the gates between the two worlds of so-called death and so-called life are very thin, which is why spirits can manifest and why, why at least in Celtic culture, candy and, and treats were left not as, a, not as like a friendly um, trick-or-treat thing, but like leave us alone, don't kill us. You know, here here's something. Don't take this instead of me. That's the tradition, and um, yeah, it's important to understand. Halloween is really about the time in which the mortal world and the world of the dead, the 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 very the gateway that is always very thin between them anyway, is very porous. We can cross that border very easily in the spirits of the dead and their spirits can enter this world much more easily. And we, even ordinary humans, if we're attuned to it, can see into their world. And that's so I think, yes, it's very appropriate to to uh, to get into death. But, but sort of as a pivot point between that, when you were talking about the absence of meaning, I think that's very relevant to modern people's total rationalist scientist scientific way of looking at death is that because that most people believe there is no i would say most educated people today seem not to believe that there is in any afterworld or any afterlife that they don't believe we have lived before and they don't believe that consciousness exists beyond death and the more that people believe that, the more the seeds of nihilism that you were speaking of, I think that is really the root cause of it, is the the majority of human beings today, unless, you know, people who are truly religious in some way or the other, but the majority of people, as you see reflected in social convention, is that that's an archaic superstition and that we're just a collection of cells and, you know, electrical impulses and that they're born that come out of nowhere and then just deteriorate and die. And then you enter a void of blackness of nothingness that there is no, that the mind is not continuous, that the mind does not survive the experience of death. And that's the root of this, this fatalism, this total, this nihilism that you're referring to earlier is that people don't, the, in other words, life has absolutely no meaning for most people. Because if all we are is just a temporary, you know, biological that comes into being and then deteriorates, what is the point of doing anything? So no wonder if people are that limited, if they don't understand that mind does not begin with birth and that it does not end, end with the separation of mind or spirit from body, you know, what other choice do they have but then to be completely nihilistic, selfish? And this leads to, and these relevant to death, very relevant to understanding what death is. The fact that most people, I've seen this especially during this whole corona period, which I believe is an accentuation of the Kali Yuga and a deepening of it, Rather than people looking for a period, 
they seem to be more materialistic than ever. I don't know if you have noticed that anecdotally in your own life. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, that kind of surprised me. I thought it could be a time for reflection and, and, and maybe returning to philosophical and spiritual truths. And on the contrary, it seems like it's, it's led to more, you know, I can't use any other word, but stupid, nihilistic, rationalistic, pseudo-rationalistic materialism in the most gross manner. And that reflects in terms of what you were speaking about before, of the absence of meaning, of thinking mythology is just old stories. And something I've noticed in particular as a spiritual teacher, a hostility to the very idea of karma, for instance, a very strong hostility generally to the idea that your actions have consequences. And it's very interesting, of course, that the people who are most adamant and ardent that karma is not an absolutely true phenomenon, to be blunt, selfish assholes, are the people who are most vociferously are that karma is not relevant or or this crazy idea if they don't believe in it, it, it doesn't affect them. So the more pathological, the more toxic, the more narcissistic our society becomes, the more I see a great deal of hostility to the very idea of karma, that that your actions have a consequence. So that is a major, and this is very important to understanding death. If you don't understand, your karma is going to decide what your next life is going to be. Your karma in the past decided who you are now, and that you are much more responsible for what your future will be than you think. But it first requires that you take responsibility for your own thoughts, for for your own actions. And that is like at the core of this spiritual hollowness is a lack of belief in basic ethics that what I do is going to have an effect. Most people, I think, have really sunk so low that they think we're nothing but, you know, electrical impulses and chemicals. And there is absolutely no meaning to this existence. So just not even in the sense of existentialism of Nietzsche or Sartre, but just, you know, every man for himself, there is no meaning, there is no purpose. So it's very important on Halloween to reflect on one's own ideas about the afterlife and how much who you are and what you will depends on your actions, on taking seriously that you have responsibility for your own actions. And then a secondary part of that, though, uh, obviously would be a, a very minority niche in society these days. I see more and more hostility in general to religion of all kinds, not just the false religions that are toxic and obviously unhelpful, like a lot of fundamentalist Christianity or terrorist Islam, but all religion, all spirituality, it's become very common to attack and castigate all of it. And a refusal, I see too, a hostility, maybe because I'm concerned with spiritual matters more, I see it more. And I, again, I'd be interested in your insight on that or what you have both experienced with it, a, a hostility to the idea of the gods, a real, you know, a fierce feeling that even accepting the idea that there is something greater than humanity is a threat to the human ego. And so I've seen this lately, and I believe it's of the Kali Yuga. If humans can't accept karma, if they can't accept that you are shaping your future and the future of others through your actions, and if you can't accept that there are beings on a much higher realm than us, and that humans are at a relatively low level of the hierarchy of, of beings, then there's no point in even thinking about initiation or magic or anything or spiritual phenomena of any kind. So I just wanted to add that, that I I think that's a very disturbing trend of our time that is becoming more intense to my experience. I would have to agree. Yeah, I would agree. And what I see, even in people who are... Uh, allegedly spiritual practitioners, um, their spiritual practice almost becomes uh, an extension of their materialistic uh, worldview. 
in that while they may believe in the gods, they believe in the gods only so much as, or only so far as what can the gods do for me or what can I gain from the gods? Um, theurgy is, exactly. is put on yeah, a back trans- burner and put, yeah, trans- they have a transactional. Right. Mm-hmm. It's more about what wonders. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 it's okay. Yeah. It's, it's more about what wonders can I work? Um, the wonder working is, is in the forefront. Um, and the theurgy is, is put secondary it's it's interesting and i'm not really judging but it seems to be a trend that the uh the material gain is is in the forefront for a lot of spiritual practitioners um and material gain through through magic is i I agree and in fact with my own with my own students i have this tension because i actually have had many more students apply during the corona time because i do think people are seeking some kind of meaning or spiritual order though they may be flailing around in the way they're doing it but the difference between thaumaturgy and theurgy is very very crucial to the whole we're talking about is it's amazing to me that most people really can't conceive of a relation to the gods that is as a mentor as a teacher uh, someone that sh- that shows you a higher realm of wisdom than humanity is capable of. Instead, they see it as a, a you know Amazon of the cosmos in which you can order things from. So yeah, that's absolutely true. And not understanding theurgy, I think, is a very very important part of of this flaw in current magical thinking, which we even addressed last time. And Chagyam Trungpa, the the Karmakaju Buddhist teacher spoke of spiritual materialism, which I think very much is the perfect description of what you're talking about. Even outwardly metaphysical people are only using magic and metaphysics and spiritual activity as a prop for their mundane needs. You know, it's just like a yeah, just like ordering something. That's that's what they see it as. And it's this concentration, particularly from this idiotic book, The Secret, and this this idea of manifestation without involving the gods, thinking that that human willpower alone is sufficient to change reality. So yeah, I think that that too is part of the diagnosis of the spiritual sickness of our time. And we may have touched on it last time. I don't remember. And and for the record, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, improving your situation or or gaining things through magic or through relationships with the gods. But I, I think it just needs to have the proper perspective. Well, and I want to jump in here and. But let me, I do want to follow up on that. But go ahead. Uh, just quickly, and this this will just uh, supplement it. I, I want to mention that this trend is even among so-called magicians. There's even people, uh, and this has been over the past at least five to five years, if not ten. Uh, they're not very big, but there is a contingent of magicians, mostly who work with goetic spirits and other forms of demons from grimoires, who are uh, who are actively opposed to the idea of celestial powers and working with them, uh, even to the point of trying to persuade other people that they don't exist. And that all that exists are underworld spirits, and that even if they do exist, there's no point in engaging them. And I think that this um, trend connects in with the same sort of, I think everything we're discussing comes from a certain, you could almost say, uh, agenda. There's a certain contingent of forces that are very active in the world right now and are trying to undermine a benevolent spiritual impulses including you know reverence for the gods and i think that that's kind of connected into what you're talking about yes i i think part of the kali yugic experience that we all have to address if we're if we have any spiritual awareness at all is that and part part of what i think this ties into what i was mentioning right before that this hatred of the idea of karma this ferocity about god the, the very notion of the gods being more powerful than us and having more wisdom than us, you know, being offensive and repulsive to people. Whereas once it would maybe be dismissed as an archaic superstition is now like violently 
I believe it's because demonic forces, and by that I mean malevolent spiritual forces that are that are counter-initiatory, to use the phrase of René Guénon, there are counter-initiatory beings that wish to keep humanity stupid. And they are envious of, of humanity's ability to awaken, um, and they try to stop it. And I don't think enough people are aware, if they're not aware of gods, they're certainly aware that there are lower elementals and totally malevolent beings who, who, if you're on an initiatory path, try to, to lead you in the wrong direction. And I think that's, a, I mean, that's something that magicians in general these days don't take into account. Now, obviously, with the Goetia and that kind of thing, which, of course, I experimented with a plenty and successfully so in my youth, um, I would look at it quite the opposite. I have no idea why anyone would think these lower demonic entities, and some of them are just simply different names for ancient gods, of course, so that makes no... Astaroth is Ishtar, you know, why, why bother with Astaroth when you can go to Ishtar? But to my mind, why would you deal with these lower demonic entities rather than the celestial beings? So that seems crazy to me, and, and maybe literally is a kind of demonic mental illness that's caused by these beings trying to prevent people who are even exploring the spiritual path from, from getting to the traditions and, and wisdom legacies that would lead to awakening rather than going deeper, you know, deeper concern with getting things with, with the spiritual materialism, using magic as a shopping list rather than a, a way to open to ultimate wisdom. So yeah, I agree with you. And I think people need to be very they need to be very, and I, I think the whole spirit of our age is demonic. Uh, the Buddha said that Mara came to visit him to have tea every day. That, you know, uh, Apep must be destroyed by Set every morning. The, the demonic is always there. These negative forces are always there. But, but humanity's stupidity has allowed them in, has opened the gate to an extreme degree. So I would say even the coronavirus itself is a material manifestation of this demonic invasion and a lot of the political upheaval that's going on and the divisiveness is a material reflection of, you know, this is how it affects the material world. And I think magicians need need to be very cogent of that, to be very aware of that. These are not just material phenomena. They are reflections of things going on in the spiritual world. And you have the same perspective that we do on this. And, you know, I, I hate to even have to make this caveat, but I don't identify with any political party and I don't take sides with either poll um, because to me, they're two heads of the same hydra. However, uh, I will say I right. do not find it coincidental that, and I also make this caveat that there are literally thousands upon thousands of good, good Chinese people, and 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 they're they're the Chinese people are good people, just like all human beings are innately good. However, communism is evil at its root, and I do not find it coincidental that the virus came from one of the biggest communist powers in the world and the forces that are undermining uh, the West right now, their tactics and ideology are directly out of historical communism. I mean, I don't want to dwell too long on that on the show, but uh, no, that right. I, 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 I like, you know, and I would hope that people forcefully know I also don't take any political side and I've lit, you know, actually my new song, the nice people and they, which is on my YouTube channel and just was part of this EP that I released on July 4th. It addresses, you know, the current political situation in a way that none of my music before and probably after ever will be. But I feel so strongly about that. If you're any kind of spiritually aware person, you must disassociate from party politics and right and left and anything to do with being on one side or the other, and and this gets into non-dualism, which is something we intended to discuss. Is that if you understand non-dualism as the as the very essence of what reality is and the informing foundation of mystical experience, then any kind of partisan politics is is ipso facto wrong. 
it, it is not reflective of reality. Non-dualism doesn't allow you to take a political side. So, yeah, I agree. And then on a deeper level, I, I of course, agree with you. Communism itself, Bolshevism, Marxism, is a part of an earlier demonic entrance into history. It is the same negation of the gods, the, the, the vicious homicidal atheism that informed communism and still does, and that we saw so horribly in the Cultural Revolution and in China's own destruction of its Buddhist and spiritual traditions. The hatred of religion is at the heart of communism. That is really, and that, that is why I've always considered it to be a demonic force. It's not just a political force by any means. And people mistake, maybe you have the same experience, my virulent contempt for it, or more than contempt, uh, uh, position to it. It is it is a spiritual warfare because communism, and I've seen it firsthand in the DDR. I've seen what a communist nation is like, bereft of any anything to do with the otherworldly, with the spiritual, with the supernatural, with the cosmic, with the celestial. It's it's a nightmare dystopia, and it's it's you know that sounds like John Birch propaganda from the fifties, but I'm coming at it from a totally other perspective. If you're a mystic, if you understand the value and necessity of spiritual initiation, then communism, you know, is certainly a demonic force that should be opposed by all means. So, I agree with you, and and of course the karma of China. Um, being the source of this and also a deeper issue i mean science is not completely clear yet about it but the the destruction of animals for human consumption seems to be at least part of what caused this worldwide crisis uh, going above and beyond the chinese communist party uh the whole you know the using of Animal life for human consumption is part of it, and certainly destroying the habitat of animals was a big part of 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 why this disease crossed over from the animal to the human. So those are karmic consequences. This thing didn't come from nowhere. It came from karmic behavior of humanity. Humanity opened the gate to this, and it, it did lead to this demonic invasion, which I think spiritual people can see and you know, non-spiritual rationalist people have no idea what we're talking about. They just see a series of chaotic events that have no meaning. But nothing that occurs in this world doesn't have its root in the spiritual world. So, Nicholas, from your perspective, speaking of meaning, and um, I mean, we've, what's even more terrifying than Halloween is is the reality that we're living in right now, and and uh, which is emphasized right now in the United States by an election, which is. Uh, an extremely terrifying uh, <laughs> proposition. I am wondering how, what's, in your opinion, what's a positive way for people to consciously um, live in this world? Uh, well, are you saying in the, in the face of the catastrophic and depressing events that are all around us, how, 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 how do we lead a meaningfully spiritual life and not despair? Yes, that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I think the the only way, and I've been saying this since the beginning of this in in March when it became very a serious crisis, is cultivate your inner life, and this is tied into death and to Halloween. We can see that all outer forms of government, of economy, of even your physical body, are temporary. They are very fragile. They are not anything to be relied on. The future we right now, you know, as a musician, I can't even imagine what sort of future will it be. There can there are no live performances, you know. Um, but on on a greater level, nobody can envision what the future will exactly be like, or if even there will be one. And the stupidity of people who refuse to take this virus seriously and entertain conspiracy theories that are literally killing them. And they continue, even after they've become afflicted by it, to believe in these theories is almost a new landmark in human stupidity and self-destruction. So when you look at that, you if you're a spiritual person, you have to understand instead of 
counting on the outer world, the material world, you better start taking the spiritual world and your inner world seriously. So I've said this before, this is the perfect time. Devote yourself to meditation. Devote yourself to prayer. Devote yourself to ritual. Devote yourself to purifying your negative karma and coming to terms with death. Because death is very near to us now, not just because of Halloween, but because, you know, the fatality rate is getting higher and um, death is all around us. So it's, you know, it's more likely than ever that you will be dead. So you better start figuring out who you are and what you are. And and I think that's a perfect, you know, way to get into concentrating on the death theme of Halloween. Be the way to deal with it is this election, as horrendous as it is, is just another manifestation of samsara, uh, the political chaos going on in America. And I, this is particularly for America, that I have to say there isn't anything quite that dramatically horrific going on in Germany or, or other European states. But America's karma, like Malcolm X said, the chickens are come home to roost. The damage and destruction that that country has done to the world is coming back to it. So therefore, take karma seriously. Look at it as a lesson. Now, you, ha- you, can't, you can't hide your head in the sand and pretend these things aren't happening. As many positive, like toxic positivist new age types will take everything as being positive or it's a good lesson. That's not what I'm saying. But look at what's happening in the world as a wake-up call for you start taking your spiritual life seriously and start understanding we are we're not going to be here for long one way or the other whether you live a long healthy life or you die tomorrow this little brief candle flickering candle of an existence is very fragile very uncertain as all spiritual traditions have always taught what is eternal is your mind so get in touch with your mind through meditation through spiritual practice don't be a dilettante anymore find a spiritual tradition that speaks to you and practice it diligently i mean mine is tantric buddhism and the worship of set the two separate uh religious traditions that is my direction but whatever direction you find practice it diligently and and renounce this world because this world is you know not if you can't see now that there's nothing reliable about the physical phenomena of the material world what more do you need to see it you know it's all literally going up in flames literally falling apart the very fabric of our society is crumbling in the face of all of these crises and it's a spiritual phenomenon so that's the main thing I can say. Look look deep within you. Don't take what's going on outwardly as something to rely on at all. You should be able to see that. And this gets into the tradition in all mysticism of renunciation. Don't get hung up on this world. Don't think the outer world is going to provide you with happiness or satisfaction. It cannot. It never did. It never will. The only answer lays within in spiritual practice. So... You know, if people are listening who are interested in magic or interested in mystical traditions and religion and spiritual practice, this is the time to totally devote yourself to it. That, And that that's really the only answer there can be to that question. Nicely said. And I think we need to address the idea of suicide and mental health as well, because all those things that you said are true and it paints a pretty grim picture. But um, suicide would not be uh, the easy way out that it may seem to be for, for some people who are suffering right now. Right. No, that, that, no, I'm glad you brought that up because as far as death, the topic of death and Halloween, you know, it's not just a fun gothic decoration death. It's, it's it, the separation of mind from body is something we have to take seriously, but not for the reasons people think. And in this age of despair, when many people are extremely depressed, when, you know, misuse of drugs as an escape 
valve are becoming you know an epidemic which is not really reported but that's happening people are uh, alcoholism and drug addiction are becoming greatly exacerbated during this period and people are becoming suicidal With, without the ego props of their normal life many people are thinking of killing themselves hoping that that will be an escape but it's it's our moral responsibility to say that killing yourself does not end the mind whatever misery you, you know and i people are thinking of killing themselves that is not the solution there is no resting in peace that's a ridiculous idea there's no such thing as resting in peace you don't automatically go to a better place just because you die and in fact as most spiritual traditions teach including tantric buddhism but also catholicism and, and most spiritual traditions even shamanism if you destroy your own vessel that all of your millions of years of karma have created deliberately that is an act of murder so killing yourself is very karmically heavy it is it's just because you have decided to do it to yourself doesn't mean that it's not murder and i don't think people understand that on the karmic level and secular humanists will get really pissed off about that because they think this is one of your rights is to kill yourself and the the movement towards euthanasia programs and and making suicide a, a legally condoned choice is very negative spiritually so the main message to make it as blunt and clear as possible if you're in a terrible situation either something's happening to you that you find unbearable or you're in a psychic condition that is creating depression you will not end that dark feeling or that disturbing emotion by destroying your body on the contrary your mind will continue exactly as it is to go deeper and deeper into a darker place and it will lead ultimately to the hell realms so suicide is no solution there is no escape death itself is not an escape from the mind mind was there before your body was created mind will be there when your body is gone and you know that's the most significant thing and if there's that's not a theory that's a fact and if you don't come to terms with it you're not living in reality you're living in a delusional reality where you think there's an end to life there is no end and killing yourself won't make anything better it will make everything infinitely worse also a karmic factor unfortunately depression is a very egotistical state of mind and i know that hurts people who are in a state of depression to see that it is a form of extreme selfishness and when you kill yourself and you leave your body behind for your loved ones to contemplate and to look at your suicide and to look at the the depression that it will cause in people who cared about you it's an extremely negative karmic thing to do to other people it's extremely it's a selfish act which is in many ways an angry act not only a depressed act it's it's a way of harming others and therefore it is extremely karmically damaging if you take karma seriously you are creating a terrible next life for yourself far from escaping from the torments you may think of this current life you're asking for a much worse existence possibly in the hell realms you know but i say that for people who who can begin to understand it for the average person that's superstitious nonsense and they think the body is just a a, a temporary construct that once it's destroyed you'll no longer feel pain so i can only stress it as clearly as possible your pain will become worse and more enduring and it's important to deal with whatever the cause of your depression in this life is now using spiritual methods rather than thinking you can escape from it merely by destroying your physical vehicle because your mind will still be there with all the same depression but worse than it was the moment before you killed yourself so I hope that's clear enough but I do think it's important in a time of of wholesale despair and depression to say that. And let's repeat that too. Let's repeat that it is it's not we're not talking about theory here. We're talking about fact. 
you know and, right. and anybody familiar with spiritist traditions we've also you know we've had espiritistas on the show we've had voodoo saints on the show you know people who deal directly with discarnate spirits on a regular basis and they can also attest to the fact that you will encounter if you're engaged with the with the discipline where you in turrets you will encounter spirits of suicide sometimes and these are often the spirits that are suffering the most because sometimes i i had one teacher tell me uh, a priest who i worked under for several years that um you know suicides in some cases they remain stuck in a certain dark state of existence for several hundred years before they can even move on to another state in the spiritual realm it, it, it absolutely that, that is suffering. true yeah it, it only whatever suffering you're feeling and i speak directly to people who may be greatly suffering and may have had a real loss you know maybe they really have heartbreak or or they have lost a loved one or something in their life has gone terribly askew those are temporary situations as bad as they are be strong and stick it out because suicide will it will either put you in the hell realms or you will become a wandering spirit caught between the worlds and that will be a life of torment much worse than what you're experiencing now and as you said there's not a single spiritual tradition that condones it and I, I, we're assuming that the people listening to this are not worldlings who take the material world more seriously than the spiritual you have to pay attention to tradition is telling you there's a reason why every single religion absolutely refutes that suicide is an escape. Well, and you touched on this a little earlier, Nicholas. Too, it's it's not there are not just repercussions for your your own self, but uh, there's a domino effect, at least in the Buddhist perspective, uh, for your family. There's there's karmic repercussions that that do go down to others. Well, absolutely. Even even on a worldly level, let's leave alone the spiritual. There's no family that has experienced a suicide of a loved one that is not permanently traumatized and marked by it. So it's such a selfish act, and there's no excuse for it. And and also, now, this is a deeper thing. A, a lot of people think, well, if you're in pain from a, a terminal illness, the wise and humane thing would be to just allow yourself to be killed through an opiate overdose or something like that. And this is increasingly becoming a popular and acceptable idea. And unfortunately, in a nihilistic, demonic world, I'm sure it will become legal. I'm afraid that it will. That's the wrong thing to do, too. We need to experience the karma of dying. We need to be awake and fully experience death. Because that is a necessary part of the negative karma that brought us into this world. Um any this is a sensitive issue too even for animals that are dying if you have a beloved pet you should not immediately bring it to be put to sleep as is the euphemism for killing or murdering um because that animal needs to live through it's we need to live through the pain of the body separating from the mind we need to go through that experience it's an initiatory experience we have to go through to purify ourselves of the negative karma we have accrued over billions of years if we don't if we if we try to cheat that you know through a so-called humane euthanasia which i repeat is murder and by the way this will be controversial uh i certainly believe in women having the right to do whatever they want but whether you want to believe it or not abortion is murder just as euthanasia is murder you may have the right to do it but spiritually karmically it's it is a murder of a being um so the, these are i think that's not what people think halloween's going to be fun and games and trick-or-treating but if you want to use it as a time to seriously reflect on death and the consequences you have to think you have to realize what you are doing when abort a being that is coming into this world and when you destroy yourself even if you think there's every good justification it's only leading to extremely negative karma for yourself and for others and and just to be clear too i mean i don't know that we're necessarily judging anyone who's going through those situations um 
and we're not we're not coming at this from a political perspective as we mentioned earlier was, not at all yeah no just to be- not at all i mean i have i i have been responsible for many abortions i'm not speaking of uh, i'm not saying i'm guilt free in that regard but i'm saying once i converted to buddhism and i know some people will find that abhorrent not a political issue murder is murder you you can't murder anything i mean i i i'm a vegan and i was before that for many years a vegetarian so i've understood that on the animal kingdom level but killing yourself or others for any reason is going to be extremely negative karma for you and will lead to all the effects we're discussing so i think oh or any let's leave a line suicide a lot of people as they get older think well i want to die and that's fine and understandable and even natural part of of the death process but you need to go through the suffering of death it is an initiatory experience that teaches us something and removes the negative karma that brought us here so i have to reiterate that death is not a negative thing and in fact there is no such thing as a negative thing from a transcendent initiatory point of view every experience is never go through to transcend it we need to see all of it and we need to accept it in a non-dual way so yeah i think that's some those are some of the most important things about death that can be said you know on a practical level and and we've brought up spirits and of course you know in halloween you have this sort of whitewashing of spirits and turning them into either cute or entertaining images but being a ghost is a very real phenomenon too not a superstition it's very possible for you to die without knowing you were killed in an accident or in some other swift you know an act of violence and that's probably something we should address too you know is the world of ghosts and spirits is very real well i mean actually on a practical level just this morning a close friend of mine had a visitation from the vars who died a few years ago there's nothing romantic or fun about ghosts ghosts are as you said and i think this needs to be stressed too a lot of people make the mistake of sort of pseudo spiritual spiritism or spiritualism of reaching out to the dead for information and wisdom and i think it's important to say they don't have any more or less wisdom than human beings they are they are unfortunate you know they're they're wanderers between the worlds they don't have something positive to tell us they're lost the reason that they haven't moved on to uh, becoming another being or having another life is because they're stuck here so that whole that whole idea and tradition of uh of reaching out through mediums to dead beings for for wisdom is not a good idea and many occultists might find that shocking but it's important to understand you don't you don't want to get information from someone who's stuck between the worlds which is what a ghost is and if no matter what tradition you're in whether that's um you know a, a pre-christian or pagan tradition whether that's a christian or abrahamic tradition whether that's a buddhist tradition whether it's a diasporic tradition whatever it may be it is beneficial to the dead to do to perform spiritual actions on their behalf um, because of the fact that they Absolutely. are suffering yes. and they don't have the spiritual opportunity in the same way that we do when we're in the flesh unless they cultivated that opportunity while they were in the flesh. No, that's very well said. Uh, there's a weird idea that when you die, you suddenly become some spiritual master. No, you don't. You're the same person you were when you died except you don't have a body or therefore without a body you can't manifest anything you can't make anything happen except have thoughts and all those thoughts are going to do is create a new being a new life for you but then they can have no material effect anymore so yeah that's a very important point and i don't i don't see that magicians and spiritual people even think about that very much you would think they would but you know on halloween let's let that be a a focusing point and it's very 
Also, the reason to continue to do beneficial acts for the dead, which of course is uh, all spiritual traditions have it, that being who you loved, who you are dealing with, who has passed on, has been reborn somewhere in, in one of the six realms of being. Whoever you have lost is still there. And you can still communicate to them, even though they are no longer exactly the person or animal or whatever they were, they their mind has moved on to another being. And though it's different, it's also the same. So you can communicate to the dead. They are alive now in other world. And the flip side of that, we have to understand, is this life that we're experiencing is the afterlife of whoever we used to be. You know, the person we used to be thought their life was all important, but now we are living their afterlife. And this eternal chain goes on and on and on. And that's something else to reflect on at this time when the, when the veil between the two worlds is thin, to think about how different that is from the average understanding of what reality is. We are living the afterworld of other of many other people and and we are just going to become the the dead person who the next afterworld will be about and that that's sort of what goes on in this mortal realm and there's a reason that in ancient traditions the the the, the world that we're in is defined and is the world of the mortals the world of those who die so those are the and as you said these are the facts of death they, these aren't theories that you can argue about um this is there, there's no way to negotiate with what will happen with death very interesting points to uh i think contemplate meditate on and not only are we uh potentially the the rebirth of prior humans in a way i mean the gods die different spirits in different realms according to buddhist uh cosmology and, and theology they don't they aren't stagnant in in their in their hells or their heavens sure there's they're still migrating right. no the god the, this right this is why spiritual practice matters because through you know you we have been all the beings in the six realms we have all been gods we have all been demons in hell realm we have all been hungry ghosts we have all been animals and we have all been humans and they have all been us through this million billions and billions and billions of cycles of existence and in different worlds and different dimensions, we have all been everything we can possibly be. So, and yes, the gods die eventually. They live much longer lives than humans or animals or hungry ghosts, but they, they eventually die and they have horrible deaths. And then they exhaust the positive karma that allowed them to become a god, and then they return to the lowest level again because they have exhausted all of the positive karma that allowed them to have the pleasant and relatively trouble-free life of entity or deity then they can start right down at the hell realm again if they have accrued negative karma so that's another important part part to recognize is that you are going whether you like it or not it's a fact you're going to become another being and, and you are right now the sum result of all the other beings you have been before. So this should help distance you from the idea of your ego, of your individualism, of your you know totally isolated self-existing self. That's a fiction. We, we are the sum total of billions of beings. And unless we take our spiritual practice seriously and liberate ourselves from this mortal realm of suffering we will continue in this futile cycle of just because you know endlessly recycling as as um beings who will suffer so that those are the important things to keep aware death there is actually no death the problem is that life in its negative sense keeps continuing as a source of delusion and suffering and awakening from samsara means awakening from life and death completely both of them and that may be hard for the average person to understand if they've had no experience of it but they should aspire to be able to realize that that there there is 
consciousness beyond this endless and absurd cycle of death, birth, and death. That those are not things we want to keep going, in other words. I think a lot of people in the occult world think of reincarnation as an interesting adventure or an opportunity, but in fact, it's a problem, which is why Alex Burzen, one of the Dalai Lama's translators, the scholar, rather than use the word reincarnation, translates the phrase as compulsive rebirth. And that's what it is. It's like a disease, like a, a compulsive activity that we keep being reborn. We don't want to be keep being reborn into this world. And I think people find that very offensive, too. Kind of like what I said about suicide not being an escape. They get very touchy about that. Now, that leads me into, I think that fearlessness is important. And I think that a lot of people are afraid right now. They're afraid because of the massive changes in the West here in America. They're afraid of all of the um, political you know, changes and in the instability and the violence. People are very mm-hmm. afraid due to the virus. Um, and my question to you is, do you think that, do you think that a non-dual perspective can aid people in having a more fearless response, a more fear, practicing fearlessness in the face of yes. this impermanence? Absolutely. Being, being a warrior is very important. You must be fearless. And if you understood that, first of all, if you really understand what's the worst thing that can happen to you, if you think it's death, that isn't going to happen. Your mind's going to continue when you die. If the virus kills you, if you die as a result of political upheaval and revolution, if you die as a result of wildfires or natural catastrophes, which are going to continue to be horrific due to the selfishness and stupidity of humanity destroying the earth there's nothing to fear in death so for so if you don't have to fear death you don't really have to fear anything that's one reason to be fearless but if you understand that you do have to take karma seriously because your actions now are creating your next life And if you lead an ethical life, if you lead a life that is in keeping with what is called review, you you are you're not going there's not going to be anything to worry about in the future. If you have an ethical discipline and a moral discipline, you your karma will blossom in a way that is beneficial and positive. Secondly, understanding the nature of reality. This thing that you're frightened of is an illusion all of it, no matter how intense it may be. If World War III breaks out tomorrow and there's atomic warfare, it's still a dreamlike illusion. This is not the ultimate reality. So the more you're aware of emptiness, the more you're aware of the illusory nature of this sensory field that we think is the real world, the less you have fear. And I can say that, it, you know, I'm not just speaking theoretically my spiritual practice and i'm sure yours it does create a state of fearlessness i'm not afraid of dying i'm not afraid of anything that could happen i'm not afraid of any of the manifestations that are of reality because if you see them as illusory if you see them as temporary and impermanent thought processes um states of mind they're not real things that are happening then you you become much more relaxed about them. You you there is nothing to fear. That's the fact. If you really delve deeper into spiritual practice, you will see for yourself. There's a, the what is to fear is not to understand the nature of reality and to be keep cutting up in an illusion of samsara. If you can transcend that, there there it is possible within your own lifetime to transcend fear altogether. You have to be you have to develop a warrior discipline to deal with it no matter what religion you're in i think all religions would agree with that including even supposedly peaceful christianity well said and i can't agree enough and i'm sure that dominic agrees also um as usual we could probably talk all day with you there's so much we could go into that we're definitely going to have to invite you back again 
I'll be I'll be happy to accept your invitation. And we'd be honored to have you. I definitely want to give you some time to talk about what you're working on right now, what you're planning on working on in the future. Uh, what's what's going on with you creatively, spiritually? Mm-hmm. Um, what's in the mix? What's out there? And what's in the works? Yeah, well, briefly, I mean, my spiritual and creative life are one thing. So the, the creative work that I do, the artistic work that I do, is the material manifestation of the spiritual. Um, so recently, during this whole corona crisis, I have not been idle at all, and I've deliberately devoted myself to working harder than ever because I've had more time, actually, more focused times. So in this time, uh, on July 4th, I released the EP I'm Afraid of America, which includes a cover version of David Bowie's I'm Afraid of Americans, a song called They, which is about the conspiracy theory madness of our time, and another song, the third song on called The Nice People, which is a critique of the politically correct madness of our time. And all three of those videos are on my YouTube channel and can be found easily and the actual ep is on bandcamp and spotify and the usual streaming services and on the autumn equinox we released our album berlin noir which is the second of my solo albums after the illusionist which was released august 10th last year so september 22nd the autumn equinox Berlin Law was released, and that is available in all digital form on Ben Camp and um, Spotify and all the usual places. Yeah, and then the, the final and revised and ultimate version of the Manson file, which is the third version of it after the 1988, the 2011, and this final 2020 apocalypse edition of the Manson file is now available for pre order. And you can get that at themansonfile.equid.com, and you can pre-order that now. And that will be available in November shortly. It will be published on Manson's birthday, and then it will be actually being shipped out in later November. Um, That will finally come to manifest, and that, as far as I know, will be the end of my 33 years of involvement with the whole Manson phenomenon uh, although there are even there's a film version in the offing too but we have to wait to see what happens with the corona situation before we can see if that will even be a reality so those are the major things that i have uh, manifested lately and then the future projects i prefer not to speak of because for magical reasons it's better not to speak of them until they're fully in gestation, but one thing that is moving towards reality is a definitive book on Abraxas, which was a subject we were going to discuss, but which we can discuss another time. So that that's what at the moment I've been up to. Very nice, thank you. And that is definitely a subject we we're both passionate about. And we'd like to touch on for sure. But knowing the three of us on this, when we get into these conversations, that's probably going to take up a whole podcast. Well, why shouldn't it? The ruler of the entire universe and the god of gods and, you know, a handful of religious scholars and nuts are the only people thinking about it. So it is definitely worth at least one podcast. Absolutely. But the book. So true. Yeah. The book about Abraxas has been a long time coming. I've been uh, I was going to give a lecture about it uh, twice and both times the lecture was canceled in bizarre ways. Once. Well, it's, it, I'm going to tell the story in the book because it's actually very an Abraxan thing. Why the, why this lecture I was going to give kept being canceled, and I finally decided it's not meant to be, and I will write a definitive book that will communicate what I have to say after my many decades of working with that deity. So usually I write books when I feel like so much misinformation has been out there that I'm I'm compelled to correct the wrong uh 
material that's already been out there that has led to disinformation. So as with many of my other books, that that's the point. There's so much misunderstanding about Abraxas and he's sort of been minimized. It's almost underestimating to say his importance. So I wanted to uh, emphasize that. I am looking forward to that very much. Um, it's it's definitely a personal, it's definitely a personal passion and interest of mine as well. Uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast. We love having you on, um, and it's our hope, as I know it's your hope, that this conversation will be a benefit to all who hear it. Absolutely, and um, I think the final note, as in keeping with our fanatic theme of death is the most positive thing you can do for your spiritual life is to be aware of death being your constant companion nothing to fear but a motivator to to increase your spiritual practice with diligence and i will end with the final words that the buddha said at the moment of his death is practice with diligence thank you very much we truly appreciate it it's my pleasure. Happy Halloween to all. All right, that was Nicholas Shrek uh, returning for a second chapter on the topic of sonic magic. We were delighted to have Nicholas back on the show. His insights, as usual, were deeply pertinent. And I'm grateful that we took a turn into maybe more serious waters. I think during the season of transformation of death, it's a good thing to reflect on the deeper implications of our actions, including the potential for self-harm that seems to be increasing due to the prevalence of this epidemic. So we're, gr we're glad to have had him on here to offer some insight into the metaphysical consequences of death and karma. These might seem like heavy issues, but the things we all have to face on a daily basis, if we can manage to do so consciously, I think we're going to be a lot better off than if we turn around and attempt to ignore that which is so present right now. Yeah, I thought it was a, a great conversation, as was expected. Our last conversation with him was really excellent as well. So I would definitely direct any listeners who haven't heard that conversation to go back and listen to that episode. Um, but, you know, it was a serious conversation with a lot of heavy topics. And, you know, he's the perfect guy to, to, to do that with us. Um, he, he's kind of made a career out of being a bad guy. I know uh, we he may have come across as controversial on a few issues. He wasn't scared to touch some hot button topics which uh, we welcome that kind of conversation because you know it's 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 more interesting and it's real and it's his truth that he's found through decades of serious introspection and practice and you know it's something i think worth considering well and the fact is there's a lot of people these days that are afraid to be honest about what they think or how they really feel if it doesn't fit the official party line. And for me, it's refreshing to have someone be honest and direct and frank and express their perspectives and ideas without fear of backlash or retribution. We're in an atmosphere right now that increasingly seems to be gaining a resemblance to the nightmares depicted in 1984 and Brave New World and the dystopian science fiction prophecies of Philip K. Dick. It's become unsettling to me and to many others. And so as fervent believers in free speech and freedom of conscience, uh, we strongly support the individual right to mental, emotional, ideological, intellectual, and spiritual autonomy. No one should be bullied into silence. And I think Nicholas's perspective and example could stand to be emulated by more people. Yeah. He's super down to earth um, and very approachable. Um, and we, we did tend to have a kind of a heavy Buddhist um, lean or we, our, our conversation kind of leaned heavily into the Buddhist kind of territory. 
And I think that was just because the it's kind of a shared language between the three of us, and we can understand the terminology um, and, and what we were getting at. I think a lot of what we talked about, though, could be seen mirrored in Western traditions as well. I don't think it's an East versus West thing. I mean, especially the idea of the hungry ghost. I mean, you you definitely see this in uh, antiquity in the West. Um, you only need to look to maybe the Greek magical papyri to see that a lot of the spells that the magicians would be doing would be um, focused on uh, spirits of of what would be called the hungry ghosts or uh, those that died violently. Oftentimes you would go to like a, a gladiatorial arena to find the, the spirits of those who died violently or uh, someone who drowned. I mean, this is exactly what we were talking about um, except from a little bit of a Buddhist perspective, but it's, it's very much the same. Yeah. And I think we're getting outside of East versus West dichotomies and labels would be useful for many people. Um, yes, Nicholas is a practicing Buddhist, but he's also a practicing Setian, and he's also a magician. And I think implicit in the vocation of a genuine magician is a sort of defiance of boundaries and iconoclasm. And I think that it would benefit our listeners to perhaps consider a more free mind that doesn't see things in terms of categories, whatever those categories may be. Um, ultimately, it's just a game of identity politics. In the end, it's all about the truth. What's the truth? Truth is relative and truth is universal. There's two sides to it. And the fact is, what we're trying to get at as magicians, as practitioners, as philosophers, as theosophers, mystics, we're really seeking to come into contact with that which is genuine, that which is true, that which is beyond the changing forms of shifting appearances. We need to penetrate into the heart of truth and seek that essential knowledge. And I believe with all of my heart that our guest this week is somebody who also holds that very dear to his soul and heart. Agreed. Nicely said. So um, I think now we can move on to our book review part of the show. Speaking of the East, I'm going to uh, present a book today that I've had on my shelf for many, many years. It is called Japanese Death Poems. It is written by Zen monks and haiku poets on the verge of death. And it was compiled and with an introduction by Yol Hoffman. Now, this is a really interesting little book. Um, it's essentially haiku poems written by, by monks and poets in Japan right before they died, allegedly. And it was kind of a, a thing that was in fashion for a certain time. And I will just read part of the introduction to give you a taste of, of what this book is like. It's, it's really interesting. Part one of this book explores the tradition of writing a death poem against a detailed background of attitudes towards death throughout the cultural history of Japan. Part two contains death poems by Zen Buddhist monks, and part three is an anthology of haiku, never before assembled, even in Japan, written by some 300 uh, or so Japanese poets on the verge of death. The death poems of most of the better-known haiku poets and many of the lesser-known poets as well are included. So this kind of touches on, obviously, very, very relevant to our subject matter in this this episode of death. There are hundreds of these poems. They're very short and concise and moving. Um, some of them are humorous. Um, some of them are very dead, you know, very serious. Um, and when possible, after the after the poem, there is a description, if available, for for the author, if the author was known, as well as if there is a backstory to the poem that is known. So um, it's very interesting. I would highly recommend it. Um, it's an easy read. It's good for contemplating these things that we've been talking about. You can just flip through, find a poem, um, and kind of ruminate on it for a while. Um, it gives you a real sense of what that person was going through at that moment that is oh so critical, as we've 
been discussing. So again, that is Japanese death poems written by Zen monks and haiku poets on the verge of death, uh, compiled by Yoel Hoffman. All right, and that's a wrap. Keep it spooky this Halloween season. And remember, the entire month of November, pretty much, is really the death season. This is related to the astrological sign of Scorpio, which rules sex and death, which are inextricably connected. In Haiti, it's the Fete Gede, Fete Gede, where there's a party pretty much for the month celebrating the dead and the ancestors. The Day of the Dead, Day of All Saints, these are first few days of November. It's a festival celebrated in both Christendom and pre- among pre-Christian practitioners. I'm not going to give you guys a whole laundry list, but suffice to say that you have a month to contemplate your own death. Consider death as if it was standing before you every day. Consider the idea that you could pass away at any minute. Your life is not guaranteed. It's something to consider. Think of your actions in light of the impermanence of your existence in the body that you dwell within. Think of the impact of your actions and your words and your thoughts and your practices, not only on your own life, but on those around you. Think about the footprint you're leaving and think about the footprints left behind by those who came before you. Some things to consider. Something else to consider would be supporting us however you can. That may be as easy as liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, giving us a rating and a review on iTunes. You know, all of the typical stuff podcasters ask their audience to do for them. I guess we're obligated to do that as well because we're making a podcast. So um, we do really uh, appreciate it, actually. And it does help us get a little bit more exposure, which is nice. I'd like to give one last plug for Nicholas. Please check out his new album, I'm Afraid of America. Um, as you should be. America's a scary place, and we do scary things. It's a great album. Um, Find it on Spotify and Bandcamp, as well as other places. Um, Check out the book that he was mentioning, The Manson File. And we'd also like to plug his manager. We've spoken to her a few times over the years, and she's pretty cool. And she runs an Etsy shop with some handmade items gothic inspired soaps and perfumes which is pretty interesting um the name is sefen hex berlin or sefen hex berlin i'm not sure which one s-e-i-f-e-n-h-e-x-e berlin and so on that note i think uh, we are done so we appreciate you listening and look forward to next episode so stay tuned
home is the cat at home. Home sweet home is the cat at home. There's been a mist. 